adverse effects of cannabis. Um, and I don't know, can you folks at Roostown nod if you can hear me well? We can hear you. Oh, very good. Um, so that's the title. Let me go to a... I might just play. I think I'm just gonna go from this view. All right. Um, apologize, I, the, there are things, I'm trying to see things and there are things in the way of my seeing things and there we go. Now I've moved the things, that's what I wanna do. All right, so that's the title. Um, between then and now, um, I haven't had, I mean, I, I would like to spend more time talking about some other risks in more detail, uh, but with a limited amount of time and so forth, and with actually quite a few risks to discuss, uh, we will proceed with this one. Uh, first of all, you know, you've all heard marijuana is uh, being approved as a medicinal substance. Uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at the various states that have passed medical marijuana laws, um, you'll see the number of benefits that are um, that the various states see in this medicinal substance uh, is quite a wider variation. It goes from um, eight um, eight uses um, in things like District of Columbia to my home state of Illinois with forty uh, benefits. Um, State of Oklahoma here, I don't know what actually to say because in the Oklahoma law, anything that their doctor says it might be useful for is considered a, um, an approved use. So it's, it's theoretically infinite, I suppose. Um, and I made this slide for a talk I gave in Alabama. Um, Alabama does not have a medical marijuana law yet, but when they proposed one in their legislature last uh, spring, they were talking about having 33 recognized benefits, <clears throat> including psoriasis and schizophrenia. <clears throat> if we go to the other side, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, all of these benefits are listed on the state website. So every state that has a medical marijuana program has a website where it describes to the public information about the program. And um, I don't know if they're quite fully aware of this, but they also describe to the public the benefits of the plant, um, or actually I should say the medicinal substance, because as we'll see, uh, cannabis no longer actually refers to just a plant, at least in the legal sense. Um, but for each of these 33 states and District of Columbia that has a website that tells benefits, um, this is the number of risks that the public will learn about marijuana, medical marijuana, uh, I should say, from the programs that have medical marijuana, uh, states that have medical marijuana programs. So it's kind of a, well, a difference. And actually, I'll point out, not in line with what we believe to be um, scientific reality about well, how medicines work in general, and particularly about how this one would work. Very brief review. Um, I think most people in this audience know about the cannabinoid receptors, um, and to the extent cannabis pharmacology or THC pharmacology is discussed at all, it's usually it interacts with the brain's endogenous endocannabinoid system, um, of which the CB1 receptor is a primary part and the target of THC. What oftentimes doesn't get discussed is the steps after uh, CB1 activation. And those are some very important steps to sort of gloss over because what happens is that there are two primary pharmacodynamic actions. One, when the CB1 receptor is activated on excitatory synapses, it will inhibit the release of glutamate, um, thus weakening the excitatory signal and potentially explaining why it may have um, anti-epileptic and anti-anxiety properties. Um, at, at the very same time, on synapses which are um, GABAergic or which are inhibitory, uh, CB1 activation by THC will weaken or uh, will, will, will weaken the release of GABA, which is the brain's primary inhibitory transmitter. Um, and uh, we'll talk some more about that in a couple of slides. So brief review, glutamate is, uh, you could call it the brain's number one neurotransmitter. Uh, more than half of the synapses in the brain use glutamate as a signaling molecule. Uh, interesting in that glutamate at two, glutamate is very much a Goldilocks neurotransmitter. Um, it needs to be just right to be, to be good. Too much glutamate is in fact neurotoxic. 
um, too little glutamate can lead to um, a lot of perceptual disturbances, including dissociation and um, hallucinations. And uh, just right, levels of glutamate actually are, in addition to just providing rapid excitation at target cells, um, is involved in uh, sculpting the brain, uh, literally shaping the synapses and their efficiency, which is the neuro, um, the, the, the sort of the wiring substrate of brain memory. So um, the bottom line of all this is that if you have a, a drug that can inhibit the release of the most widely used neurotransmitter substance in the brain, uh, a lot of things could happen. Some of them good, some of them maybe not so good. Uh, the second most abundant neurotransmitter comprising between 30 to 40 percent of all synapses in the brain is GABA and uh, THC acting at the CB1 receptor inhibits the release of GABA, which again is potentially good and potentially not so good uh, when you mess with the output of a widely used chemical signal. Um, things can happen. And some of those things, uh, when you increase GABA, I mean, it, many anticonvulsants and uh, the best anti-anxiety medicines, uh, well, that's a politically charged comment in this environment. Um, uh, many effective anti-anxiety medicines um, work by increasing the GABA signal. Um, and conversely, when we inhibit the GABA signal, uh, that can lead to convulsions and to anxiety and some other things. So those are the chemicals, and I always, I always like to say when explaining to pharmacology, um, medicines can raise or lower the neurotransmitter levels. That's kind of like adjusting the voltage in a house, but how well the house functions depends upon the wiring. So, um, you know, the, the neurochemical or the behavioral or the medical effects of neurotransmitter modulations depend a lot on which circuits are involved in the amping up or the tuning down of activity. And the CB1 receptor, the primary target of THC, um, is basically everywhere, and including some extremely important real estate where we make our decisions, uh, where we form our memories, where we um, generate our fear responses, where we generate our um, sense of nausea or not, um, and where we generate our sense of reward, um, among other things. Oh, and motor control and coordination. So think about what it does, and you can see how cannabis might enhance or detract from that endogenous function. Um, and why it is that I think there is great confusion about what cannabis can actually do or not do in terms of benefit or risk is because people are different and actually what gets called cannabis is widely variable um, and we have different genes and, um, and, and different sorts of endogenous wiring. So very, um, you know, I, I will, I, I, I will say again, I'm on record for having pot be legal, and it truly does have medicinal actions, but uh, nothing that's medicinal at this level of um, depth of interaction will um, go without causing some risk for some people. And then the question then, who exactly gets to say which risks are legitimate and which ones are made up propaganda by prohibitionist fear mongers? Um, typically, we don't have this debate about medicines because we have an FDA that will um, do studies and tell us what is required. Um, however, FDA is entirely silent on this other than being in line with federal government policies of Schedule one drug and um, so forth. So we we have a, uh, the, the the primary regulatory agency is is really out of the loop. Um, this leaves a big vacuum um, at which basically strong opinions will fill the space. Um, and some of those opinions are driven by money. Um, and why this is a hot topic is because it's very 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 lucrative market. Um, and if you want to get a product, if you want to sell a product legally, you have to first make it legal. So you'll get lobbyists to try to help grease the skids to change the legislature's uh, minds. And that explains why we see a fairly robust increase of lobbying activity. Um, and lobbying messages are not, I mean, you're not going to change laws by saying, and this might cause schizophrenia. Um, and you're not going to sell product that way either. So. There are, um, it, it, it's, it's a hotly argued space. Um, so what to do? 
in that kind of situation, we could maybe turn to some, I don't know, credible scientific organization that is nonpartisan and is financially independent, is not funded by any industrial uh, interests and so on. And oh gosh, we do have such an organization called the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, they were commissioned by several states and um, government, government entities to study the literature, the world literature on cannabis, and please make some conclusions about what is actually maybe good for and what actually might be some risks worth uh, that we should worry about. Um, so they conducted an extensive analysis and published this results. And um, I will, you can send me an email, I'll send you the whole, the slides. Um, and these things are hyperlinked. This is open access, so you can read the whole report. It's a big report. Um, so the other nice thing about the National Academies is that they not only listed the, the conditions, but they also ranked the quality of evidence to support their conclusions. So um, they would have conclusive evidence, which means randomized controlled trials, um, um, and, and on down. The, the lowest quality of evidence that we will consider in this presentation is moderate, in which there is some evidence to support a conclusion um, and uh, without any significant contradictory studies. Um, and so, conclusive evidence, pain, nausea, and interestingly, patient reported muscle spasms, um, but uh, objective muscle spasms uh, rise to moderate quality of evidence. I'm not going to poo-poo one or the other, but the point is there are six benefits that, I mean, six benefits and only six benefits, which have this, meet that minimum standard of moderate quality evidence. So fine, um, substantial evidence for risk. Um, so supportive findings from good quality studies with very few or no credible opposing findings. Substantial associations with, between cannabis use or cannabinoids with respiratory symptoms, uh, risk of motor vehicle accidents, hello cerebellum, and motor control. Uh, low birth weight of babies if used in pregnancy, the development of schizophrenia and other psychoses, and um, substance use. Uh, well, uh, substance, uh, cannabis use disorder. So that's with substantial evidence. Moderate evidence, moderate again, several supportive findings from good to fair quality studies with very few or no credible opposing findings. So risks associated with moderate level of evidence include accidental overdose in children, cognitive impairments, worsening mania or mood stability and bipolar disorder, um, flat out causing a higher uh, risk of uh, depressive disorders. Um, as an aside, there is actually no data to support the use of cannabis as a tool in depression pharmacotherapy. Um, the papers that do exist on that topic um, all say that it impedes the recovery from uh, depression and it does so by very interesting uh, mechanisms of um, making SRSRIs essentially ineffective in the, in the uh, neurochemical actions of rat brain. But that's a different story for a different day. Um, National Academies notes increased risk of depression. Um, first, possibly related to psychosis, possibly related to depression or anxiety, increasing suicide, suicidal ideation or attempts, um, worsening of anxiety and causing social anxiety disorder, worsening negative symptoms of schizophrenia, and in addition to the substantial risk of developing a cannabis use disorder, there's moderate evidence to associate the use of cannabis with the development of other substance use disorders, such as tobacco, alcohol, um, you name it. Um, so those are um, third party, independently funded, independently concluded uh, risks. Um, also not funded by any industry was a survey done in New Zealand um, in the late 19th by the way, before it became the hottest of hot topics. So um, it was 1,000 adults and 38% said that it used cannabis. And the question simply was, did, it, you, know, did you have um, side effects? And 22% said it caused anxiety or panic. 15% reported psychotic symptoms. Um, cannabis and anxiety. I alluded to it earlier, and here is a graphic. So cannabis turns on C, uh, CB1 receptors. Uh, these receptors can decrease glutamate. They decreasing glutamate in certain regions of the brain may help to explain why many people will have reduction of anxiety. 
But some people may be more sensitive way um, in, for this group, for these folks, um, the loss of GABA signal is equivalent to having like an anti-Xanax or a, or a pro, uh, pro anxiety signal. Um, and it, CB1 receptors exist, that makes sense as well. So that's that. Um, and the New Zealand study showed 15% incidence of psychosis and um, that, that it's non-debatable that THC or cannabis extracts or cannabis causes psychosis. We know this because we can actually um, mimic psychotic uh, brain functioning in, uh, or, or psychosis associated information processing abnormalities by giving THC to rats. Uh, we can mimic those same schizophrenia associated neuro neurological abnormalities by giving THC in controlled laboratory to people, as well as then we can measure things um, about psychotic experiences. And it's uh, uh, very easy and very reliable to give people um, psychosis in mild degrees by giving them THC or cannabis extracts in the laboratory. And um, also, you know, as a reminder, THC is actually an approved use for medical, medical purposes in the United States. It's uh, at Schedule 3 in Controlled Substances Act. Um, it's approved for anorexia associated with HIV and for um, chemotherapy-related nausea. And because it's approved, we have clinical studies. And you can read um, the hyperlinked FDA THC prescribing information and find that it happens between actually 3% to 10% it at, um, at clinical study doses, which are between two and a half and 10 milligrams a day. Um, by the way, in Ohio, I, uh, the state of Ohio considers a daily allotment of THC uh, to be 590 milligrams. So um, in, in oil for vaporization. So um, it happens, and uh, the, the best estimate that I can find about the likelihood of happening psychosis acutely is between 3 to 15 percent. Um, so psychosis is a symptom that it revolves around misperception, and schizophrenia is a longer-term illness that sort of revolves around psychosis. And um, it's a little bit more complicated to talk about these relationships, but uh, here are some concerning observations. People who use cannabis and have schizophrenia had an earlier age of onset between two years to six years, depending upon the strength of the THC that they were using. And there's also um, a dose response or an exposure response relationship. The more cannabis a person uses, the higher the odds that they will later be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, there's a, a meta-analysis by uh, Marconi et al. And these are a bunch of, well, these are odds ratios on the y-axis and a measure of cannabis, cumulative cannabis exposure on X. So various studies find various degrees of increased odds, but overall about four for the increased um, risk of a, or increased odds of a schizophrenia diagnosis. Uh, we also know from a limited number of studies that have been done in people with schizophrenia that using cannabis is associated with poor outcomes and with an exacerbation of symptoms. Um, and we also can explain this chemically. I told you about glutamate. Um, cannabis also triggers glutamate release and dopamine hypothesis is a, is a, is a pillar of schizophrenia um, etiology hypothesis. So um, there's overlap in, in the biochemistry of schizophrenia and the pharmacology of cannabis with respect to dopamine and glutamate. Um, those CB1 receptors exist in our brains because they can respond to a natural product that our brains make called anandamide. Anandamide appears to have anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective functions. Uh, but getting cannabinoids from plants appears to reduce the levels of the, of the cannabinoids that your brain makes. So we observe that anandamide levels in marijuana users are lower. And uh, one then hypothesis is that the chronically lowering protective anandamide renders the brain vulnerable to inflammatory insults that can then translate into schizophrenia. And if that hypothesis is correct, that actually explains why we see poor response to traditional antipsychotics because um, the usual pathway to schizophrenia is too much dopamine. But if cannabis-associated schizophrenia is really an inflammatory process, then dopamine drugs are going to be less effective. Um, and finally, LSD, the 2A two, the two receptor of serotonin is the primary target of LSD uh, to cause it to be hallucinogenic. And uh, giving people, uh, giving rats, 
regular doses of THC actually hypersensitizes their two A receptors. So um, if that weren't enough, then I told you about the brain function changes. We can also see behavioral changes in animals that are reminiscent of those seen in schizophrenia. Um, this is an infographic that shows human laboratories, uh, population studies, and the, and the government of Canada who decided to legalize just make recreational cannabis um, free and legal requires that cannabis packaging uh, carry a warning for, for increasing the risk for the association with cannabis use and increased risk of schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, the other sorts of things to worry about a bit is that the endocannabinoid system is a very, very, very ancient system. We see endocannabinoid systems present in um, throughout the evolutionary um, pillar of, of, of organisms. And uh, CB1 receptors are pre present in the placenta. Uh, they're present in the fetal brain. And they're involved primarily, uh, presumably by glutamate fine tuning in uh, sculpting the brain. So that may relate to why we see odds ratios hovering around two for low birth weight, small gestational age, and admission to NICU um, in babies whose mothers use cannabis during pregnancy. Um, Sad but interesting study of, um, of aborted fetus brains shows that if uh, mothers, if, if the fetus had been exposed to cannabis in utero, that they actually re record lower levels of dopamine receptors in the fetal brain. And that might be related to seeing that um, kids, as they grow up, um, if they were exposed to cannabis in utero, have um, signals for unusual thinking patterns that are reminiscent of those seen or thought to be pro-psychotic. -psych, pro um, this is a very interesting and very worrisome article. There have been like three families of longitudinal studies, so cohorts of kids that have been identified that were exposed to cannabis in utero and following this, these cohorts into adulthood um, are showing um, across the board changes of um, executive function and behavior. Um, and then if I, tell this, if I tell this sort of story to people, um, I usually hear, but no, 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 no. That's cannabis. Medical marijuana is different. Medical marijuana, they tell me, has low THC, which is the risk promotion, which is the intoxicating ingredient, and high CBD, and so on. Um, so, I mean, it's a widely held view. Um, but nonetheless, we don't know what the long term exposure to, to, to these things are going to be, period. And finally, that bit about uh, medical marijuana being defined by low THC, not really true. Um, at least for many states, actually, it, whether it's medical or not depends upon your intent only. Um, as I said, this is I gave a talk in Alabama, and when Alabama was considering their uh, medical marijuana law, this is a legal definition of cannabis that was at play. Um, all parts, all extractions, every compound derivative or mixture or preparation. I mean, they're, they're, that's it. 90% uh, THC oil for vaping could very well be called medical, can medical marijuana under Alabama and the laws of other states as well. Um, so I guess this is the end maybe, and um, uh, you know there could be more to say. If you want to chat with me offline, these are ways to get in touch with me and send me an email to this address. I will send you the infographics on anxiety and schizophrenia, uh, psychosis risks, as well as um, I can send you the PDF of the full slides. So just to make sure that there are no more slides. Nope, that's the end. So.